Neuropharmacology is the study of how drugs affect the nervous system. The nervous system is organized into a number of tiny neural circuits in the human body that can be grouped together into larger units called neural systems. These systems carry out a broad range of more complex sensory functions, such as hearing, vision, and oculomotor senses. We'll look at a few ways in which drugs can affect these systems and the physiological consequences that follow. Now, it's time for drugs. In neuroscience, it's useful to categorize drugs on the basis of whether your body produces them naturally. Those are known as endogenous substances, endo meaning coming from within, and those that are not naturally produced in the body are exogenous, exo meaning from outside the body. Just to briefly explain how this all works, an endogenous drug like, say, dopamine binds to a specific dopamine receptor in the brain and will cause specific neurons in the brain to fire in patterns that our brain interprets as emotionally rewarding. It's a happy panda. Endogenous drugs can act as agonists or antagonists. Agonists are drugs that bind to receptors in much the same way that naturally occurring drugs would. Antagonists, as the name suggests, are drugs that bind to receptors and prevent them from activating. This is done in one of two ways. In competitive binding, the exogenous drug blocks the normal binding site, preventing the activation of the receptor. It's kind of like a security guard blocking the entrance to a building. In non-competitive binding, the drug doesn't block the actual binding site, but rather it inactivates the receptor so that it doesn't activate if the endogenous drug binds to it. Now that we have an understanding of what drugs can do, let's look at what they're made of. One important class of neurotransmitters are called catecholamines. Put simply, the body is able to synthesize different drugs by modifying the amino acid tyrosine. Tyrosine is first modified into L-dopa, which is then modified into dopamine, which is then modified into noradrenaline, and then finally adrenaline. Since different parts of the brain require different neurotransmitters, the cycle does not strictly begin or end with any one neurotransmitter. There are pathways in the brain in which we expect to see high levels of dopamine. The first is the mesolimbal cortical, which contains the ventral tegmental area. This pathway contains neurons that send their axons to regions in the frontal cortex, hippocampus, and nucleus accumbens. The second pathway is the mesostriatal, which contains the substantia nigra and sends neural projections to the caudate nucleus and globus pallidus. Overactivation of the dopamine pathways is linked to Tourette's syndrome and the death of dopamine axons in the substantia nigra is linked to Parkinson's disease. Again, dopamine is the pleasure neurotransmitter and it's believed that drugs exhibit their addictive properties by targeting areas in the mesolimbal cortical dopamine pathways. Dopamine receptors come in two flavors, the D1 family and the D2 family. D1 receptors are G-proteins coupled to alpha subunits, which are shown in green, and they increase the production of cyclic adenosine monophosphate, or CAMP, through ATP consumption by adenylylcyclase. CAMP in turn activates a molecule called protein kinase A, or PKA for short, which phosphorylates proteins, meaning the CAMP adds phosphorus atoms to proteins, which enhances their enzymatic functions. In other words, the D1 family receptors have an excitatory effect on the neuron. The D2 receptors are also G proteins coupled to alpha subunits, but they inhibit the production of CAMP and thus have an inhibitory effect on the neuron. In either case, when dopamine binds to the receptor, the receptor physically changes shape, causing the alpha subunit to break off and attach to the adenylyl cyclase. Catecholamine reuptake inhibitors are a class of exogenous drugs that increase the availability of dopamine, adrenaline, and noradrenaline by blocking reuptake in three ways. In competitive antagonism, the drug is taken up by the transporter instead of the neurotransmitter. You can think of the transporter as a neurotransmitter vacuum cleaner. When the drug is introduced into the body, it makes its way to the synapse and clogs the transporter, basically disabling it for some amount of time. In non-competitive antagonism, the drug causes the transporter to be taken into the presynaptic cell where it can no longer reuptake neurotransmitters. And during reversal, the drug causes the transporter to move neurotransmitters towards the postsynaptic neuron instead of reuptaking the neurotransmitter like a vacuum cleaner that starts shooting out the refuse you spent hours cleaning up. Meth is insane. Another major neurotransmitter is serotonin, which is synthesized from an amino acid called tryptophan. Serotonin is produced mainly in the raphae nuclei and nearby areas, and it's involved in mood disorders such as anxiety and depression. Serotonin receptors are subdivided into seven families, all of which are metabotropic with the exception of the 5-HT3 ligand-gated cation channel. This is a useful chart if you're interested in the various effects of serotonin around the body. Opiates are pain-relieving drugs that act on opioid receptors. Exogenous opioid ligands were discovered before their endogenous ligands, but we now know that endogenous opioids are small proteins called peptides that are manufactured by neurons. Morphine, codeine, and hydrocodone are all exogenous ligands with varying affinities for different subtypes of opioid receptors. Endorphins, encaphalins, and oxycodone are some of the endogenous ligands you'll find in the body.
There are three primary opioid receptors, all of which are G-protein coupled receptors. Activation of the mu receptors produces analgesia, or inability to feel pain, euphoria, and addiction. The kappa receptors can be activated and will produce sedation, analgesia, and dysphoria, which is a profound state of dissatisfaction. Activation of the delta receptors is thought to produce analgesia, but more research needs to be done before we can say for sure. Over the same time period that saw an increase in prescriptions for powerful opioid medications, the death rate related to prescription opioid drugs has nearly tripled. Having at least a basic understanding of the addictive properties of drugs is the first step in reducing drug abuse. What follows may be the production of less addictive synthetic opioids or even new forms of medicine altogether.